Hi everybody and welcome to ODTUG's online education series. Today's presentation is the new face of Oracle Analytics presented by Stuart Bryson of Red Pill Analytics. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the ODTUG website. Please put your questions into the questions box at any time during the presentation. Stuart will try to address them as they come in, but probably most of them will be answered at the end of the webinar. So welcome Stuart and thank you for being here today. Thanks so much, Karen. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to do anything for Odie Tug. It's always a pleasure, so thanks for that. So this is called the new face of Oracle Analytics. We'll get into a little bit about what I hope to cover. Uh, what I really hope to cover uh, from, from a high-level perspective is to just give you a fresh look at Oracle Analytics in general, and not just the tooling. We'll take a, we'll take a look at the latest release of the of the cloud, um, Oracle Analytics Cloud. But also, I want to impress upon you that that the world is changing, and Oracle Analytics is changing as well. And there's a there's a lot more that we can do in the analytics space than we used to. So that's really the the marching orders here. So we'll see what what you think about sort of the messaging. So this is me, uh, I'm an Oracle ACE director, primarily in analytics and data integration. I like to say I've been doing data for about 20 years, and that's a lot of different permutations of what that means from traditional data warehousing to more recently big data and cloud data uh, approaches. And uh, some of that is, is what I'm bringing to the discussion today. I'm also the owner and co-founder of Red Pill Analytics. So we're a Oracle Analytics consultancy, uh, as well as um, public cloud. We're still about 60% Oracle, but we also do a lot in the, the Oracle cloud, obviously, but also the Google cloud and uh, AWS. So really our, our, our focus for the last few years has been moving on-prem workloads into cloud uh, implementations or hybrid implementations. It's really just the approach to try to make the most of your current investments, but also leverage uh, cloud uh, anywhere that's possible and, and modern architectures as well. So just a little bit about OD Tug. They are, um, you know, sponsoring this event. It's their, it's their webinar. Uh, but um, something near and dear to my heart is K-Scope. I've spoken at the last 10 K-Scopes, I believe. It's, it's just a really great time. It's an excellent opportunity to learn to to learn from and meet and rub shoulders with uh, a lot of the, the thought leaders in the Oracle community, and nobody does it better than than OD Tug and K Scope. So please, if you've if you've never been to K Scope, there's no time like the present, and, and the event in Seattle is going to be, you know, every year I say it's the best, and it, and it probably will be the best again this year. So great venue, uh, great chance to to really go and, and, and learn primarily, but also have a really good time. And there's a, there's a whole lot of BI and EPM, and I'll say analytics and data uh, opportunities at, at K-Scope this year. If any of this, you know, if you wanna learn more about this, obviously reach out to OD Tug. Feel free to reach out to me uh, via Twitter, et cetera. I'd be more than happy to either answer your questions or connect you with, with the folks that might be able to answer a little bit better than me. So uh, if you take nothing else away from this webinar, uh, you should really truly investigate K-Scope 19. So I wanna start kind of with a history lesson. Um, and it's really about this, the state of analytics as we inherited it many, many years ago and, and how so much of what traditional enterprises are doing is still so much like, like, like what you're gonna learn in this history lesson. And you can, sort of take a look and see if this looks familiar to you. What, what we've been doing with data for the last, you know, really 20 years or so um, is still pretty similar. And that means that we go and pull data from a series of transactional systems or transactional sources typically. We process that data, we conform that data, um, we curate it, and we deliver it to this, this data warehouse, traditionally been in Oracle databases. And, you know, we try to, 
denormalize it to a certain extent, but but maintain a bit of normalization and try to really structure it in such a way that that reporting is is much easier than it would have been against the transactional system. And we do things like standardization and aggregation. And then we point, you know, at least for the last uh, um, many years, hopefully what we what we've wanted is a single BI tool with a single sort of catalog single business model and present that to the organization. And what I'll say is there's still a lot of value in this. I mean, if you think about what it takes to close the books financially, if you think about so much of what um, enterprise reporting is, there's still tons of value in this, but there, there's always been use cases that have, that have challenged this model. In a lot of, in a lot of cases, it's, a, it's around flexibility, agility, and rapidity of how quickly we can get new data or modified data or modified forms of analytics in front of the end user. And, you know, traditionally, at least for a lot of our customers or the customers we've worked with over, over many years, anything that sort of sits outside of that model has been, you know, frowned upon. And I think that that comes from good intentions. But what I hope to talk to you about today is that not everything has to be hammered into this, you know, into this model. And I think that there are things that are different today, which I'll get into, which really should challenge you to be thinking about how you do analytics a little bit differently. So uh, apologies for this very dated uh, diagram, but, it, but it's with a purpose. It's from the Data Warehouse Lifecycle Toolkit from Ralph Kimball. And that's why it looks so old, because it is 1998. And I think that so much of what we learned here, which was very much a product of its time, is still exactly what we do today. And if you think about anything in the technology world, if you're doing things exactly like you did them 20 years ago, it's probably time to rethink it, right? Our jeans are a little bit more snug now. Uh, we don't necessarily wear baggy clothes. So if you think about, you, you know, it's time to revisit almost anything, especially in the technology world. So I'm gonna challenge, not necessarily that this is a good working model for how to do things, but there are some things that are different. I want you, to, one of the main things to notice is the data staging area there, where in big capital letters, no user query services. So the idea there was that storage was so expensive that we would stage data with no permanence whatsoever. And I think that's the biggest thing that's changed is that storage is, is, the, is the, um, the least expensive thing now. And the idea of having to stage and, and rip and replace and, and, and truncate your staging area every day is really a, an artifact of, uh, of another time. So, you know, we have object stores where we can dump raw data forever and have it highly available. And that's sort of the first thing to start thinking about is where to put our raw data because it does have value. So this was just really a, a look at very much how we used to do things and there was a reason for it. But, but, almost, but most of the principles that define this architecture were products of limited technology. And there are things that are changing today that, that should cause us to rethink it. So if we want to talk about really, you know, what has changed, and most of you on this call or on this webinar probably know some of what I'm going to say, but we're going to cover it anyway. There's just so much more data now. And, you know, 2018 produced more data than all the years up to 2017 combined. And 2019 is going to be exactly the same. It's going to it's going to, we're going to produce more data in 2019 than the prior, all the prior years combined. And that trend is, is, is going to continue. And so we have to start thinking about, you know, data is only an asset if it can be managed, curated, and distilled to some point. It's really a, it's a constraint if all you have is a bunch of data and nothing to do with it. So we have to start thinking about, we do have all this data, but if, but if we don't make it actionable, if we can't really work with it, then it's it's like looking for that one piece of paper in a huge filing cabinet. If you don't have some order to it, it's not really going to bring you any value and it'll actually inhibit 
your data-driven decisions. And not all data is corporate data. So for many, many years, when you looked at data warehousing, we were traditionally pulling data from ERP systems primarily, and maybe other one-off systems that were either legacy. And in the last 10 to 15 years, perhaps we're um, layering in a, a, a SaaS application or two, something like Salesforce, something like any of the uh, cloud ERP systems. Um, and so we were starting to layer in this data, but it still looked very corporate. And additionally, if you had an ETL tool that could connect to relational databases, that's pretty much all you needed. But that's also changing. So not all data is readily available with a JDBC connection or ODBC connection. It's more common is for that data to be available via REST. So what you have to start thinking about is, yes, there is corporate data locked up inside of relational databases still, but that's not the only that's not the only source of data. And we have to start thinking about this in a more widespread way. And so if you want to think about really how to start positioning your organization or your BI or analytics team, we have to start you know, taking some of the cues from the digital transformation that's occurring for a lot of organizations. And what that means is trying to understand your users. And this is, this is uh, sort of borrowed from, from what e-commerce companies think about when they think about trying to deliver an experience for their end user. Um, we need to start thinking about delivering analytics in a similar way. And that's try to understand what it is that our users want and not dictate to them what, what they're gonna get, right? We need to start thinking about what is it you really need and we need to build a platform that allows us to, to sort of facilitate those needs. But lastly, we need to start thinking about what does a team structure look like in this new world versus what it used to look like in the old world. So that's kind of the marching orders today. And if there's just a couple of sort of uh, um, points I'd like you to, to take is that one of the things that the Kimball methodology taught us to do, and is still very valuable, is to think big, is to always be, always have in mind an end state, always be working toward a unified, conformed end state, but we don't always have to start there. And so, especially with the demonstration I'm going to do, which is a, which is a, um, a very quick demonstration, is is how we can be more agile and how we can. Um, not rely 100% on this methodology. Sorry, I was just checking to see if there's any questions. It doesn't look like there is any. So I don't know if any of you have seen this slide from Spotify. Um, if you've ever seen me speak uh, in person, I probably have this slide in there. But it's it's relevant, I think, because um, and, and this is how Spotify builds applications. They don't focus on too much on that final product. They don't focus too much on the car that they want to build. Instead, they focus on adding incremental value every step of the way. And I think from a data warehousing perspective, we've been so focused on making sure that the data warehouse and the model and the reports and the ETL are all so perfect before we turn it over to a to a group of users that we really do a disservice to those users. We should be trying to give them incremental content at a rapid pace. And that means that we think about this in terms of audience size. If all you're doing is building content for a department, there's no reason why it necessarily has, has to be 100% perfect. We have to introduce the concept of rework get content in front of an end user for feedback. And if it's a smaller audience, we can, we can work through some of the data discrepancies and um, some of the, you know, we'll say gaps in the data. And if we can help users answer 60% of their questions quickly, then we can rework 
and work toward a paradigm where we start to try to answer 90 or 100 percent of their questions but we don't have to have all of those questions answered before we let user number one into the system so if there's one thing you can sort of think about is how can i incrementally give users if they have 10 questions that need to be answered i don't have to wait until all 10 answers are available before i give them four five or six answers and this is what it means to be data driven it means to unlock your data as quickly as possible have a look at what's missing perhaps there are gaps identify those gaps but work with the data you have and there's no better source for feedback for what the data is missing than your than your audience the the users that are actually going to use it so i want to do a quick demonstration so here's where i would change screens and and hopefully you guys can see this uh, I'll just ask Karen quickly. You're, you're seeing my change in screen, right? Yes. All right, fantastic. So what you're looking at is this is the Oracle Analytics Cloud. It's the it's the newest version. And I'm just going to demonstrate quickly kind of the, the principles I'm trying to, to get across. So we're going to create a new project here. And this is Oracle Data Visualization, which is a, a key component to um, the Oracle Analytics platform in general. Um, and, what you're, and what you're seeing is, is exactly what it looks like. This is the newest release, so, so OBIE on-prem is one release behind or two releases behind, depending on how you look at it. Oracle Data Visualization Desktop is, is in the newest version is available now. So this is pretty much what you'll see with any of the more recent releases, all except OBIE on-prem. And what, and what you'll see is, I'm going to grab this table. It's from the Autonomous Data Warehouse service. So I loaded up some data into Autonomous Data Warehouse. And I'm just going to, just going to build a quick uh, visualization. And this is a brokerage data set. So this is trades, customers, stocks, et cetera. And so what I, what I want to focus on in this visualization is I want to take a look at um, fees by the executor. So you can think of the executor as uh, as the person executing the trade. So this is your broker, probably would be a better name broker. And we'll take this and we'll drop this into a data set. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with data viz, you can see it's a, it's a much different interface than what we're used to with metadata that we had to spend weeks, months, whatever, building before visualization number one gets in front of an end user. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going directly against the autonomous data warehouse. And I think one of the other key takeaways from, from this talk, you know, I don't work for Oracle, uh, I'm an ACE director, so I think Safe Harbor is in place, but, but in general, this is the focus for the product going forward. So we have to start thinking about building our analytics in the platform of the future. And that probably means, again, I don't work for Oracle, that probably, probably means less focus on on metadata less focus on catalogs and more about rapid um, delivery of, of analytics the great thing about oracle analytics in general is that both sides of that coin are available to you so as i i get into a little bit later a, a triage process where we can talk about what things probably belong being delivered immediately versus curated etc so obviously this isn't a very good visualization. There's way too much data here. So let's start, let's start working on it a little bit. First, I'm just gonna make it a bar and we're gonna prune the data down a bit. First, let me sort this high to low. Still not much helpful, not very helpful. So let's focus on a particular date. We'll go to Today, we'll look at the last, we'll say the last few days. And so we've pruned our data set down a little bit, still not very helpful. So let's see if we can take a look at just really the, the highest fees, right? So. So what are the highest fees by sort of the executor? 
and we'll drill it down even further. Maybe we'll just grab those. Think about how hard this would have been to do in answers and dashboards, which is sort of the point. And what I'm looking at here is fee by executor. Let's break it down just a little bit further. Maybe we'll just grab the top seven. And so what I want to look at is these are our highest fees by executor. And we also want to take a look at, let's see what commission looks like al along those, those same lines. And we can immediately see a problem, right? So we see that we have one stock trader has actually earned more commission than fees. Obviously, that's not a, a, a trend. Um, it's, not a, it's not a trend as far as we can see here, but it's certainly um, not ideal. Also, what's not ideal is the fact that I'm, I'm looking at these uh, broker numbers, right? That's not very valuable. So if you think about if this were my data warehouse system, and I guess you could argue that never would you have built a data warehouse that didn't allow you to drill in on the, on the actual stockbroker, but let's assume that that's the case because that's the case here. What can we do about this? Do we need to onboard an ETL process to start loading executor information or, or broker information? And, and how long would we have to wait for that? Or is there, is there something a little bit more agile and rapid that we can do? Well, actually, there is something we can do, and that is I happen to have access to that data. Now, it's in a file, but is, is that okay? I, I would argue it is. So let's load that file. And here's my file. <clears throat> And we're sampling the data. Yeah, this looks good. I've got my employee ID. I've got first name. I've got last name. This is what I need. So let's 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 curate this just a little bit. And let's um, data viz automatically sort of assumes that anything that's a, a number is a measure. It's not really what we want here. So let's convert these to attributes. So an attribute job code is an attribute. And there we go. So this data set looks pretty good. There's some useful information here. I'm going to add this to my visualization. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the things you can notice is I'm not really going to go into the recommendations here, but this is the, the most recent release of data viz. It already starts to give you some recommendations. Now, I would argue that none of these are super great for this data set. But if this were the focus of our of our call, I would dive into this a little bit more. But it does give some really great recommendations. It goes ahead and talks you through pulling out day of week, year from dates, et cetera. So this is valuable. We're not going to do any of this here. And this looks good. I'm going to save this. And now let's define how this joins. And this is the important part, right? So this is again, the point about just-in-time modeling. So I don't necessarily believe that all modeling should be just-in-time modeling, but there certainly are use cases. How long would I need to wait for this data to become available? And what you're also gonna see in data flows is the ability for you to do some lightweight wrangling here as well. So let's add a match. It is that I'm simply going to match employee ID to executor and click OK. So that allows me to join my autonomous data warehouse table to this file that I've brought in. Let's save that as well. Oops, sorry.
and now I should see my file here. So if I go back to my visualization, I can quite easily just, probably the last name is what we're interested in. So we'll just replace executor with last name and see that this Will Holt, I think is how that's pronounced. Will Holt guys are culprit. Now I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that Will Holt's done something wrong, but what, but what I have identified is that there is certainly something wrong with the system that we need to investigate. So we could go take a look at these trade, at this, this, this guy's obviously making more money than we are. Um, and that should be identified or, or investigated. So the next step from this is obviously we can save this. This is nice. This is a good visualization. We'll come back to this later. But suppose that we wanted to at least take the next step to maybe productionizing this. And maybe again, it will be a while before this data set, wherever I got this HR data, is going to be available for an ETL process. That doesn't mean that we can't do something lightweight now. Uh, a little bit, a little bit more formed than what we just did. There's nothing wrong with this, but we could go and take a look at the the data flow feature, and we could try to productionize this. And we'll just create a data flow, a very simple one. Uh, um, it's going to be the HR data. Let's add that, and I could transform this. And just know that you have quite a few transformation capabilities available to you, um, even more in this newest release. But I'm simply going to load this to the autonomous data warehouse. And so we'll put this in our employees table. I could load it straight into OAC, but I, I prefer to put this in, into autonomous data warehouse. There's my connection, and I'm going to choose replace existing data. All of this looks good. I could rename these columns if I wanted. Uh, again, I have the capabilities to do some transformations. And we'll even run that. So while that's running, I'll take you back and let you see that here is my load employees, and, and I even have the ability to schedule this. Now, I'm scheduling a load from a file. Now, know that that file could be existing in the cloud somewhere as opposed to just being uploaded from my desktop. It could be actually be a relational query from another system that needs to be brought in, et cetera. But what I can do is I can schedule this, and anytime I choose to go to my data, Sorry, hold on. At any time, sorry, I'm all over the place. I can choose to reload the data. So if I wanted to go and replace that file um, with, with um, another set of data or a more updated data set, as soon as I upload it, it will run at the next schedule. So yeah, it's got some manual processes to it. But what I'm describing is an interim solution where you can hopefully get answers in front of your end users more quickly. And we don't have to wait for everything to be perfect. If the audience for this visualization is just a sales team or a sales department, then this is much better than the alternative, which is what most people have done over the years, is instead of bringing the mashup to the BI tool or the analytics tool, they take the data out of the analytics tool down to Excel. And they will dump it down to Excel and they'll mash the data up there and run around with these data sets on their laptops or whatever, which is probably not great from a corporate auditing perspective. So let's bring the mashup to the tool. Let's get the results in front of the end user quickly. 
let's plan to uh, build a better solution or a more permanent solution, but let's operate uh, between now and the time that that solution is finalized. Let's have working analytics for a small team or even a medium medium sized team that has that have decisions that that they need to make and they need this data on a day to day basis without having to to bounce out to Excel. So hopefully that demonstration, at least, you know, it's, it's sort of a small isolated uh, example, but hopefully it has you thinking about, you know, other opportunities and more, really more of a shift in mindset. So what I want you to think about is, is when you start seeing the capabilities of this tool, where it's not about, about highly curated data models exclusively, that still comes into play. However, we do have a capability in this tool in Oracle Analytics in general, all the way to, to DB Desktop and OBI EE on-prem, we have the ability to start using these different use cases. And that means to formulate a triage process. And what I want you to do is, is evaluate a few factors about whether or not you believe something should be onboarded into more of an ETL process or a formalized process versus um, just-in-time analytics and quick delivery and quick um, analytics, uh, you know, just-in-time analytics is really another way to say it. One of the biggest keys to this is the audience size. And it's also the audience variety. And what I mean by that, are we talking about, you know, a leadership team where everybody's going to come into a meeting and try to decide whose numbers are, are the right numbers? That's probably not a use case for just-in-time analytics. However, if it is just a sales team or a marketing team, if we want to discuss campaigns and we need to mash up sales data with something from our event planning system, let's go ahead and do that. Let's do that today. Let's not wait until somebody figures out a way to connect to that SaaS application and bring that data into our data warehouse. Let's start reporting on that today. Let's get those, you know, that small team of users that have very important decisions to make, let's get them data today and not force that data out into Excel. Let's use the tool to mash up the data sets. Frequency of the data. If this is data that is updated very frequently, I'm not saying that doesn't mean that just-in-time analytics can't play a part, but you have to start thinking about how, you know, what I just uploaded is a list of employees, which yes, that does change perhaps daily or at least at the very least monthly, but how rapidly do you need to update that data? Uh, we could put a process in place that perhaps uh, automatically delivers that file to an object store, um, and then it can be processed on a data daily basis, et cetera. But until we have that working, we can continue to upload the file to Oracle Analytics Cloud, as opposed to dumping OAC data or data warehouse data down to Excel to mash it up there. So this is one of the key, key criteria is the frequency of the data. So we have audience size and the frequency of the data. How, how rapidly does it change and how rapidly, uh, and how does that, rapidity of change affect the results um, just because the, the data may update not so frequently does that mean that the analytics we're using are, are still valid and the stability right so how stable does this solution need to be is there a leadership team is the ceo and his leadership in his or her leadership team looking at this daily looking at key indicators looking at trends you probably want a more stable solution. On the other hand, are you delivering something for a weekly sales meeting? It's probably okay for you to go ahead and do just-in-time analytics. Of course, where is the data located? Uh, I, I, I let off this webinar discussing that all, not all data is corporate data. And if your ETL process is still rooted in relational JDBC, ODBC connections, the location of the data could perhaps uh, be a big hindrance to you getting the data 
into an analytic solution. So the location of the data determines whether or not you're going to be able to even use some of these techniques. If your sales, um, your list of sales or brokers is coming from a different system and it's readily available to you for you to dump that data out, then this sort of solution could work. Dumping data from you know, MailChimp or other campaign management systems uh, down into Oracle Analytics to, to mash up with your corporate data, that makes a lot of sense. And also what you probably noticed is in my, in my demonstration, I didn't really know what I was looking for, right? So, so I kind of did because I practiced before the webinar, but, but in general, the idea of, I don't really know what questions I wanna answer. I wanna dig into the data. I wanna take a look at the data. And not only that, I wanna take a look at my corporate curated data and mash it up with other data sets. And I don't necessarily wanna do weeks or months of analysis before deciding whether or not that data is a candidate for an ETL process. I should be able to mash it up today and see what value there is in bringing that data into the system. And I should do that in a real world scenario. So you just think about this sort of as a discovery phase. I'm digging into the data to see if, if bringing this data set to my curated data can indeed help me answer some questions. And if it can, then this allows me to communicate that value back to the, to the teams and perhaps it's, it's an IT team or some sort of central services team and say, this data set does indeed have value. Let me show you and instead of trying to convince you, I'll just show you that it has value and perhaps you'll, you'll fast track that data set into the curated pipeline. And who are our users? Are we talking about what, what style of users are we talking about? So obviously um, not everyone is going to be um, a good fit for going and, and, and discovering questions and, and taking it further and answering those questions. Not, um, that's more the power user. So I think every department sort of has someone who would be a good choice to sort of lead these initiatives. And actually what you saw is most users could, could do, but perhaps you have one or two people identified in the department that kind of do this constant discovery, this constant evaluation of additional data assets and what value can those data assets perhaps bring to our more conformed traditional curated data warehouse. So I think that if you're really looking to satisfy normal users who expect um, a high degree of polish in their dashboards, then just-in-time data may not be ideal for them. But if you're trying to answer questions, most users will, will be satisfied with a just good enough uh, solution. I just wanna tell you sort of how Red Pill does this. And that is that if you look at our team structure, the way we're really changing how we do analytics. We used to do so much around just having ETL developers and, and dashboard developers, but now we really try to lead with the analytics side of things. So it's more about having business savvy people, analytic savvy people, people who can sit down with the end users and really talk at their level, speak at their level. Um, of course we have some some technology people on there, but we also have strategists and analysts. So what I'm gonna recommend is that you take the same approach with your team. If every department uh, should have um, data savvy people that are thinking about their data, IT is never gonna appreciate, no offense to anyone from IT on the phone uh, or on the webinar, but it's just a, 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 it's just a fact of life is that, um, Individuals from IT are never gonna have the passion, desire to answer questions that you do about your data that's specific to your department or your job function or your role. So what you, you need to start thinking about having data advocates um, on your department and structure the team that way. More and more 
data and analytics buying decisions are being determined by the business today. And that means that the business needs to be in a position to be able to discuss data and not simply rely on IT to provide those services. I think IT will always, you know, probably, at least in the, in the near term, provide the, be, the, be the team that provides the curated uh, content in some way, shape, or form. But I'm going to challenge departments to be on the cutting edge of just-in-time analytics where they can go and take that curated data, mash it up with the data sets that are, that are important to them, and communicate the value of that data with a dashboard, not a requirements document, with a working visualization, not a uh, typed up business case. And I think if you have that sort of discussion with IT, you'll be able to prove that your data set matters and it should be included in, in a more curated solution. So um, I finished up a little early. I'm going to take a few questions. I just want to take this opportunity. Give me two minutes to talk a little bit about Red Pill, if you don't mind. Obviously, we are an Oracle partner. That's the majority of our business. But we also are a partner for a lot of other uh, technologies, a lot of them cloud, a lot of them more modern in nature. Um, and a lot of a lot of these technologies, uh, we've been um, taking on-prem customers to, to more hybrid approaches using a lot of different cloud solutions combined with their deep investments they already have in Oracle technologies. So sometimes that means taking um, some piece of their workload to the Oracle cloud. That's a great solution, as you just saw. Uh, sometimes it means taking some of those workloads to some of the other public clouds. And that's really what we focus on today. So if you want to know what Red Pill does, I think it's really kind of easy to just take a look at our partners and these are the, the technologies and solutions we use. And with that, I'm gonna take a look at some of the questions. All right, so I have quite a few here. So, so one question says, we will have to take into account flexibility in your design, correct? I think I get the, the point of this, and that is that that yes, I mean, if if what you if what that that individual is asking is um, how flexible do we need to be? Let me see. Hold on, let me see if the question has. Flexibility in your design. I think I think the flexibility in the design can come from a lot of different places. So if you take a look at I'm doing this in OAC, so this is the, the analytics cloud. And the data viz desktop um, is, is, is almost identical in every way. And if from a flexibility perspective, if what you're describing is the ability to, to um, you know, upload data at different, at different um, cadences, uh, I think, yes, I mean, the, the tool allows you to, to react to just-in-time data sets in a very meaningful way. We, you saw data flows, I didn't really dive into that, but there's a lot of transformations and data preparation that you can do from a data flow. So if you're looking at normalizing data sets, case statements, et cetera, all that can be done right there in either the data preparation step or in the data flow transformation step. I hope I'm answering that question for you. Sorry if it's not exactly what you're asking. We are heavy S-Space users. What issues have you come across connecting to S-Space? So one of the things is that you may or may not have seen, let me see, I'll actually jump out here. When we're doing a data flow, one of the options I could have done is create an S-Space cube. So one of the nice things about data flows today is, you know, I'm not a I'm not a super experienced S. Uh, I know a lot a good bit about S space, not so much about all the surrounding Hyperion tools, but there's a whole lot of different ways to load an S space cube, and that that um, approach has changed from different releases to different um, uh, tool sets, and in some ways it's been kind I would argue kind of all over the place. 
I think what you're going to see is, is a standardization in my mind. When you're trying to use SBase from an analytics perspective, I think data flows are, are, are the future. So if you simply want to build a cube in, in the Oracle cloud based on data sets from either your data warehouse, autonomous data warehouse, et cetera, I think you're going to start seeing data flows be a really good option there. Um, there is still a little bit of connectivity, um, you know, uh, there, there's still some connectivity issues with the, in the Oracle cloud. I won't say issues because they can be worked through, but it's not um, absolutely clear. Uh, but you, but the step the steps are there for you to be able to connect to the to the S space service that comes with Oracle Analytics, and you can load S space cubes there. And that is an issue. Yeah, it takes it takes a little bit of uh, gymnastics to try to get the the S space connection working, but it but it can work. So what about operational reporting? I think it's absolutely applicable here. So the question is, what about operational reporting? And I 100% agree think that the idea that operational reporting is sort of a stepchild to analytics needs to change. I mean, operational report, you can't even start to begin to do analytics until you answer basic questions. How many orders are coming in? Where is my backlog? When, uh, you know, which warehouses don't have enough inventory? I mean, what you saw here was me connecting straight to, to, to the autonomous data warehouse. I could easily connect to any other um, data set. So in my connections, bear with me a minute. So we have a lot of options. Um, and this is, this is just not what we're used to with Oracle products and no offense to Oracle. But, but this, the sort of um, disparate nature of the sort of things that they're allowing us to connect to. I mean, Redshift, who, who would have thought we would have seen that? Dropbox, Google Analytics, all of this stuff is you know, Google Drive, which I haven't tried, so, so we'll see. But the idea that we could connect straight to these SaaS applications, SaaS services or platforms in the Oracle Cloud or other clouds, query them in place, build, reports around them and the and um data viz can give us table style reports it doesn't have to be visualizations there is drill down I, I didn't get an opportunity to show that but there is the opportunity for you to build sort of a high level dashboard and drill down to detail that is more tabular in nature so absolutely i believe um that operational reporting is probably easier now than ever before because you think about what we used to have to do in sort of more traditional OBIE is try to model that into a metadata layer that didn't necessarily make sense. See if I can get some more questions here. Just sorry, uh, sorry for the for the silence. I'm just reading some of these questions. So we have OBI 12C on prem. And Tableau for data visualization with some tech connect Tableau to OBIE metadata. What do we gain by going to Oracle Analytics Cloud? So I would argue that um, that that this is this is the best time to be to be looking at at solutions like this. From a data sets perspective, you can see. Hold on. I don't think I have anything added. I don't. But if we if if we had o OBIEE content here in our um, OAC, this would show up under subject areas. I'm really kind of surprised because I just spun this up um, in the cloud, and usually there's there's subject areas there. So I'm not sure exactly why that's the case. There might be somebody on the on the on the line that knows why. But but anyway, if I had metadata served up inside of um, OBIE in the traditional way those subject areas would show up here. And not only can I report on those subject areas in data viz, the way I'm used to, um, but I can also mash that data up in the same way. So I think that um, there are several connectors in Tableau for, uh, for Oracle Business Intelligence. There's a couple that I know of, but what I will say is that 
in my, you know, hopefully uh, nobody brings the pitchforks, but in my mind, Tableau is starting to look dated to me. And what's happening under the covers with Tableau also is very complex. So it is an arguably an old tool now. So I think when you start looking at purely cloud solutions um, and at least um, cloud inspired solutions, so, so we still have OBI on-prem, we still have DataViz Desktop, but it is a JavaScript framework first and foremost. It does have a modern look and feel. It does have APIs um, for, for building visualizations on top and APIs for building data connectors on the bottom. So it's got a very modern architecture and, I, and that's not the case with Tableau uh, or really any other tool that's, that's you know, starting to show its age. So I think that the API driven approach or, uh, is something that, that tools weren't thinking about when they were um, under construction years ago, but that is definitely how new tools are being built today. So I definitely would start to think that you might be in a better position using a complete Oracle analytics solution today because the integration of the, of the two sides of the house. Okay. So I see there's a, there's a business question about what kind of services Red Pill provides. Please, um, at Stuart Bryson on, on Twitter. Um, also, Stuart at redpillanalytics.com. Please reach out. Be more than happy to discuss that. Um, a lot of questions here, folks. So let me try to get through this. Can any validation be done in the data flow? Uh, absolutely. So my apologies for not diving into that. I had a, a, um, a short amount of time. There is a data preparation phase, which I didn't really show, which gives you the ability to sort of define your data coming in even before you start with the data flows. And a lot of that allows you to do that sort of conditional logic where you want to uh, verify and validate. Um, data flows can be scheduled. I, I think I showed that, but I might have glossed over it uh, on events and conditions. Not yet that I'm aware of. Um, the newest release just came out, like it's a week old. So there might be something in there that I haven't seen yet. So um, to be determined, uh, I'll take a look at that and try to communicate back. Is this data available to only Oracle Analytics or could it be available to something like Power BI? So what you saw me do in the data flow, uh, first off, I would say, um, you know, if you've got a heavy investment in Power BI or something else, um, you know, by all means, do what works for you. What you saw in the data flow was that I was able to write this data back. Um, I didn't, I actually executed it, but I didn't go and show you. But you are able to write back to any of your database connections. That could be an S space cube, that could be autonomous data warehouse, that could be Redshift, anything that you've built a data connection to. So this is data wrangling. I mean, it's, it, you know, there, there are a lot of purists out there that, that, that don't necessarily like mingling uh, data movement and transformation inside of a BI tool, but that's certainly the direction that most of the analytics platforms, including Tableau, are taking, building data wrangling straight in. So yes, we can write that back to anything that we can make a connection to, and then you can, you know, by all means, go and use Power BI against it. Okay, so I think the main question that comes out of just-in-time analytics is the same old historical question. These things often end up needing to be productionized, and I would I would uh I would argue that that's true. Um, I think that's that's uh, a very wise um, comment, whoever made that. But we just have to change. I mean, if you look at sort of standard software development, the idea of rework is built into the entire process. It's not something we're suddenly surprised with um, at the end of a sprint or at the end of a quarter that we have some technical debt that perhaps we need to solve. I think that um, analytics teams traditionally are made up of business folks who haven't necessarily lived on that side of the fence. 
And I think that one of the things that's really happening is more modern analytics tools and platforms and you know, big data platforms and cloud platforms. We are having sort of the software development side of the house start to leave their stamp on analytics. And I think that we need to, from agile methodologies, we need to start thinking about rework and technical debt as something that is integral part of the process. Um, if your organization simply can't stomach technical debt, and I don't mean that in a derogatory term, it might not be for you, but we have seen organizations change. We've seen organizations take on this approach and really thrive from it. So what I would say is that, yes, there is this productionized side of it, but let's think about what we've gained by building the process in this way. We've gained working content. We've, we've built something that's usable until the productionized form is available. We've built a, a, a requ requirements document. Uh, we've built a working dashboard instead of a requirements document. So it's pretty easy to sort of uh, dig in to what's worked, what's what's going on underneath that visualization to sort of see your requirements. What are the what is the what is the join logic? What is the transformation logic? Well, it's built right into the tool. It's not have it's not being typed into a Word document. So I actually believe that this approach is better than a design heavy approach. It gets the end user or the business user or perhaps the business power user to go through the process of actually build a working visualization. And that product from the from the process is much more actionable than some sort of a requirements document. I'm moving on here because I'm running out of time. Looks, per, looks pretty much like you're bringing ETL to the users. How do you prevent them from running amok in the source systems? Well, there's always, so that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. Well, there's always permissions, right? So, I mean, um, um, every data source that you're gonna bring data in from is gonna have some sort of permissions. Inside of OAC, I may have uh, permissions of who I can share my curated content with and who I can't, how, big of an audience can I share it with? But frankly, um, what happens instead if you don't adopt this is that the users dump the data out from the data warehouse down to their desktop in Excel and mash the data up. That is absolutely going to happen. And everyone on this webinar probably knows of situations where that's occurring. And that is a pivotal part that manual massaging of data in Excel is, is, is a absolute requirement to somebody getting an answer they need. And I would say, what's the difference, right? So at least bring the mashup or the data to the tool in a place where it can be secured and a place where you're not running around with perhaps um, financial data on your desktop in Excel. And let's just let's just kind of flip the paradigm. It is definitely something to be concerned with, but I think you just have to think about what's the alternative. The alternative is that they're just going to dump it out or they're going to upload it to some unsanctioned shadow IT cloud service, um, other cloud service and start mashing up the data there. So users are going to find a way around it if they have a, 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 a decision they need to make and they have they have data requirements to make that decision. Let's start supporting the end user instead of constraining them. That's just my take on it. Hi, Stuart, we still don't have a date for an OBI EE upgrade. So is it possible to get OAC standalone while we still have OBI E11G? Absolutely. I mean, um, I haven't tested this release, but you used to be able to um, connect, at least in data viz desktop, to 11G environments. My guess is that probably, if it still works, it's by chance. Um, but absolutely, I think you can, you know, if if your if your OBIE 11G environment is reporting against an on-prem data warehouse, OAC does have the remote database connect. So basically, you're able to stand up a lightweight agent. It runs in a WebLogic server, and OAC can issue the queries physically from on-prem and send the results back up to OAC. 
So there's a lot of techniques for that. I absolutely think that you don't have to wait until you've upgraded your OBI on-prem. And frankly, you should probably be thinking about this, um, not upgrading your OBI 11G on-prem and probably just moving to OAC. You're gonna move your analytics completely to the cloud one day. Um, the question is when. And so if I were to advise any customer who's thinking about an on-prem 11G to 12C upgrade, I would really advise them to start thinking about um, a migration to OAC instead. So we're one minute over. I wanna thank everyone who stayed with us for, for attending this. I really appreciate it. Um, I think you saw how to get in touch with me. Let me bring that back up. That's where you can, you can see me on LinkedIn. You can see me on Twitter. Uh, if you wanna direct message me on Twitter, that's probably the easiest way for you to do that. Be happy to speak with anyone. And again, thank you so much for, to Odie Tug for, for allowing me a, a chance to, to speak to all of you and for continuing the, the online learning. Um, you know, uh, making it possible for, for us all to, to get on their webinars and, and learn something. Um, we really appreciate it. And remember, K-Scope 19, let's uh, hope to see you in Seattle. With that, um, I'll let you go. Thanks again for attending. Thanks so much for being with us today, Stuart. Thank you all for attending. Um, don't forget this presentation was recorded and will be on the odtug.com website. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks.